on Eastern Standard Time. I think we'll wait just a minute or two and uh, get started since we still have some folks trickling in. Thanks. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning or good afternoon to those of you who are tuning in for today's webinar. My name is Cricket Liu, and I am the Chief DNS Architect for Infoblox. Um, first of all, since we have, uh, I think, a fairly substantial number of federal government employees joining us, let me just say thank you for all of you who worked during the shutdown. Um, I travel quite a bit, and <laughs> I rely on the service of federal government agencies folks who work for the FAA, for the TSA, uh, for, for DHS, and I do appreciate uh, all that you did for us during the shutdown. We're going to be talking today a little bit about the recent DHS emergency directive, explaining just exactly what motivated it, what happened out there on the internet, and the various uh, recommendations or requirements of the directive. Um, at the end, we'll be able to cover a Q&A. We have within the Zoom interface uh, a Q&A um, portion. So if you have questions that come up during the course of the presentation, please just click on that Q&A button and uh, write your question in. And when we get towards the end of Ingmar's demo, we'll take those questions. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So. We're gonna start by talking about what happened, what motivated the uh, emergency directive. And we are also going to talk uh, about how the folks, the bad guys in question, got their legitimate TLS certificates. And then we'll talk about complying with the directive uh, from DHS. And finally, we'll do a demo of a few features within Infoblox's products that might be able to help you um, both detect this sort of a compromise and also protect against it. But let's talk first about what happened. So early this month, FireEye, the internet security company, reported that a number of domains, they didn't say exactly how many, operated by government, telecom, and internet infrastructure organizations across the Middle East, Europe, and North America had, had been hijacked. Um, they weren't completely confident in this, but they tentatively linked the actors in question to Iran. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant to go along with their hijacking terminology because to me, hijacking sounds like something that actually uses the DNS protocol. And as you'll see, this is a more quotidian day-to-day -day sort of compromise. In fact, the question used compromised credentials to people's registrar and DNS hosting accounts to modify delegation or zone data. So obviously, if you compromised somebody's registrar account, say the registrar account for infoblocks.com, you can change the delegation for infoblocks.com to point to any name servers you want to, name servers that are under your control and thereby gain complete control of infoblocks.com. If you have access to DNS hosting accounts with any one of the big DNS hosting providers, Newstar, Dyn, and so on, then you can simply use their user interface or their API to modify zone data and point data wherever you like. Once these folks controlled uh, the domains in question, they used the Let's Encrypt service to have cryptographic certificates for the hijacked organization's web and mail servers issued. And we'll talk in the next slide a little bit about how that works. And then once they did that, they redirected mail and web traffic to uh, these domain names to servers that the bad guys operated that have those certs installed. So because those certs were installed, it looked like legitimate TLS uh, authenticated and, enc and encrypted sessions, and they were able to impersonate the legitimate servers. On the back end, the bad guys had their servers go to the actual web and mail servers run by the organization in question. So they sat there, 
capturing mail and web traffic over an extended period, basically acting as a man in the middle. So obviously a very, very serious compromise. Now, some of you might be asking yourself, well, how in the world do they get legitimate certificates to plug in to those servers that were acting as men in the middle? And they used the Let's Encrypt service. For those of you who haven't used Let's Encrypt, it's, uh, as they state on their website, a free, automated, and open certificate authority, and it's run for public benefit. Um, the idea, basically, is to promote the use of TLS encryption on uh, especially the web, but also uh, electronic mail to encrypt wherever possible. So Let's Encrypt is, is a very worthwhile service. It's a noble goal to encrypt as much traffic um, over the internet as, as you can. But if you look closely at the way that Let's Encrypt determines whether to issue uh, a certificate or not, uh, they look up one of a couple of different things to validate that you actually own the domain in question. And one is that they look up a DNS resource record at a specified domain name. So they might tell you, for example, hey, to prove that you really own infoblocks.com, load a text record that looks like this into your zone data. Um, another thing they might do is they might look for specified content at a specific URI. They might say, for example, well, if you say you run www.infoblocks.com, I want you to put this content at, for example, http colon slash slash www.infoblocks.com slash 8303, where that's just some, some uh, string that they're looking for. And obviously, if through a registrar account, you control delegation to someone's domain, to, from, of their domain to their name servers, or if you control their zone data directly, it's very easy to do both of these things. And that's how the bad guys actually were able to get these TLS certificates issued. So who did it happen to? It happened to quite a number of different organizations. FireEye was not specific about who it happened to. They did say government, telecom, and internet infrastructure organizations uh, in the Middle East, Europe, and North America. But beyond that, the subsequent DHS emergency directive called out that six US government agencies had their domains hijacked, hence the DHS Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agencies Directive. So we know that six U.S. government agencies uh, were affected by this. We don't know, I don't know at least, uh, who they were. Now let's move on to talking a little bit about how to comply with the directive. So the directive that came out of DHS requires the administrators of, they say, all .gov or other agency managed domains, uh, which is basically anybody who runs a domain that faces the internet uh, and is part of the federal government and requires them by February 5th to do the following. And I should note that February 5th is very, very soon. Of course, tomorrow's February 1st, so we're talking about what Wednesday of next week. So uh, the first thing that you should do is audit DNS records on all of your authoritative DNS servers. And they say you should prioritize NS records, MX records, and address records of websites, quote, that are central to the agency's mission, close quote. Now, what they mean there is they mean that you should look through your internet facing zone data to try to determine whether or not your data has been changed. So for example, are your NS records pointing to the name servers that you expect them to? Are your MX records pointing to the mail servers that you expect them to? Um, obviously, if you have a lot of internet facing domains, this could take some time and some effort. Uh, if you only have a few and you're fairly experienced with uh, DNS, you've been managing your domains for some time, you can probably just eyeball them, determine whether or not they look like they should, whether your A records uh, are, are the ones you expect them to be, whether your NS and MX records are what you expect them to be. But if you've got hundreds of domains that you manage, well, this could, could take some time. So I guess you'd better get started. Um, they also advise, number two, that you change your DNS account passwords just in case any of them have been compromised. They say update the passwords for all accounts on systems that can make changes to your agency's DNS records. So anything that's allowed, for example, through a DNS registrar like uh, GoDaddy, for example, um, or through a DNS hosting provider like uh, VeriSign or Newstar or Dyn to change your DNS own data. Uh, that's obviously fairly straightforward to do, but importantly, number three says on those accounts where it is supported, you should also enable multi-factor authentication. And in particular, because of the nature of the recent compromise, 
Um, if you can use a form of multi-factor authentication that does not rely on email and that is not vulnerable to phishing, you should do that. So for example, you might use something that uh, texts something to your uh, cell phone, uh, which wouldn't be subject to a phishing attack. And then finally, you should also monitor certificate transparency logs. Certificate transparency logs were, uh, are going to be made available by DHS uh, to federal government agencies. And these show where uh, X509 certificates that are used in TLS have been issued. And if you see a TLS certificate that has been issued for your agency that you did not request and was not requested by anybody uh, authorized to do so within your agency, um, well, that's a bad thing. That means that somebody unauthorized has gone off and uh, received a, a certificate. So you can, you can take action there, get that certificate potentially added to what's called a certificate revocation list uh, and take the appropriate action. Uh, just a reminder before we go on to the demos, if you have any questions about any of this, please add them to the Q&A portion of the user interface. Um, but right now, I'm going to turn the stage over to Mr. Ingmar van Glabeek, who's going to take us through uh, a demo of a couple of uh, features within Infoblox's products that might help you identify this sort of compromise and prevent it in the future. Ingmar, take it away. Hi there. Yes. Um, can you stop your share, Cricket? And then, perfect. There we go. All right. So I'm going to showcase um, three demos. The first is going to be uh, NS record monitoring. So if we have a look here, you can see my browser. Um, so this is a, a NIA system 830. Um, you have this, if you are an Infobox customer or if you have a grid running NIAS um, for a while now, this has been in the product for, for quite some time, you have the ability to do uh, DNS integrity checks or the NS record monitoring that we're talking about. So if somebody takes over your NS record, that means that they have full control because they pointed to their own authoritative servers. Now, where do you monitor that? Well, on your zone level settings, we have the infoblogs.com zone. I edit my zone settings. And I have my DNS integrity check. And so I enable this feature. I select a member that is able to query the, uh, the internet the frequency at which I do, and if you want, you can say verbose logging, save and close. And so what this will now validate is to check that the NS records that you have configured at your registrar and the NS records that are there because you have your zone set up in that way, if they are matching. And if there is a mismatch, they will uh, trigger an alert. You will have logging events and you will be able to take action on that. Um, if you do this to your zones right now, that's a quick way to check if you are impacted at that level. So that's gonna be the first way to, to validate. Now, the second demo that I want to show you here is the association between networks and IP addresses, uh, networks and zones. If you have a zone and you have a, a fixed list of IPv4 uh, address space, that means that you have the ability to tie that network space to a zone, which means that nobody can make any modifications to your zones or point to an A record outside of that. Now, where do you do that? Well, if you go into IPAM and you have all these zones here, and let's say that um, I only own the, the 3.000 slash 8 zone, and I want to make sure that only this zone can be used to create records. Well, I can go in here, edit the settings of this uh, network, and then go to advanced DNS zone associations. And I'm now going to add this zone to say infoblocks.com. So save and close. And now when I try to create a record, inside the infoblogs.com zone, it means that unless it's part of any of my network that I have associated with this zone, and you can see those under the zone settings as well, edit, advanced, um, you, will, you will actually not be permitted to do so. So this is, this is not just a way to, to find 
malicious intent, but also it eliminates user error. And so we can see here actually that we have a number of other zones that are associated to this domain. And then finally, and, and unfortunately, we didn't manage to, to publish it yet, uh, but we are working on a script that will be made available on the community site. If you go to community.infoblogs.com and then go to the security section, uh, we will post there uh, shortly a script that will validate your DNS uh, A and C name records against a list of your IIP space that you provide. So we will look exactly at your configuration and we will validate and point out any IP addresses that point out of your space. Now in a second phase, we'll also introduce a script to do this on an ongoing basis from the NetMRI solution. Uh, stay tuned for that, we will definitely follow up. All right, Cricket, all yours. All right, thanks Ingmar. Um, David had a question that uh, is probably aimed at you and he says, are the features that you demoed only available in NIOS 8.3? Are they available in any prior releases? No, they have been available as of, of version seven something. I, I, I went looking through our release notes and, and they are, they're really, really uh, old features that have been around for a while. So, so the version you're on, um, if, it's, if it's supported, it should, uh, it should absolutely work with these two features already. Okay, fantastic. And then Jason had a question, um, and this is, I think, a question that's partly for me and maybe partly for you. Uh, he said, uh, we've been told by support that InfoBlox only supports certificate-based multi-factor authentication. Um, and uh, I said, on, on this call, I suggested using a multi-factor authentication solution that uses SMS uh, versus email. And he says, how can we implement SMS two-factor authentication in InfoBlox? I meant, in general, if you're not using InfoBlox, if you're using a web-based uh, DNS hosting solution like, uh, for example, Dimes or Newstars, and they allow you to do two-factor authentication with, uh, with uh, a mobile phone or something like that versus, uh, versus email, you should do that. Um, but if you, if you have uh, an InfoBlox system, then presumably the system that you use to make changes to the zone data is your grid master, and your grid master is inside your firewall. <laughs> so you're, you're somewhat less subject to the types of attacks that uh, befell these poor folks. Um, do you, did you have anything you wanted to add about two-factor authentication on NIOS? Well, I mean, we, we, we have some, we, we definitely are focusing that for our roadmap. So, so um, SAML is, is important for us in, in a general concept. So, so um, I would be on the lookout for, for any, uh, or any product improvements that would uh, take care of that at a different level as well. Okay. Um, here's an interesting question that I think that you could uh, take. This is from Venugopal, and he says, if we have a hidden master, does the DNS integrity check work? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. It, it, it even works with the DNS integrity check uh, if you have a hidden master. Uh, if you have a hidden master, uh, the hidden record doesn't get checked. Um, now, I mean, um, for Frank and I have, have discussed a little bit some of the corner cases around this, and, and you might end up with some, uh, some checks that don't pass if you are using um, internal IP space for your NS records and then rely on some sort of natting uh, or firewall to do translation, uh, but it, it is all, I mean, in, in most use cases, I think that, that this is gonna, still gonna be a, a very uh, solid approach to, to validate uh, if those NS records have been compromised or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There were a few questions that I actually answered while you were speaking that I thought I might, uh, I might go through. Um, let's see, there was, there was one that was from an anonymous attendee, he said, or asked if you if we are not on the list of six government agencies, how do we determine if we were attacked? And I think the the idea of auditing your DNS data uh, is to determine whether or not you were compromised. Right? The idea is that you're going to look through your NS records, MX rec records, and A records and see if any of them have been changed uh, without your knowledge. Um, John asked, where do I find certificate transparency logs? These were going to be made available by DHS. Uh, to U.S. government agencies. Um, if you look at the, the DHS emergency directive, you'll actually see they, they name the report uh, that apparently they send out periodically. I am not privy to that report, um, but uh, they did that. 
Chris um, asked about, he said, let's encrypted that. I'm not sure how that gained them access. And I think that the point was that they didn't gain access through Let's Encrypt. They gained access through compromised credentials to registrar accounts and to DNS hosting accounts. That enabled them to change DNS data. And then once they had control over the DNS data, they could use Let's, Let's Encrypt to get um, legitimate X509 certificates issued uh, that they had the private keys to and that they could use on those, those servers in the middle it's like we have more questions, lots more questions. Um, let's see. Um, Brooke says, how was TLS compromised in these attacks? Well, it wasn't so much TLS being compromised, it was certificates being issued uh, to the bad guys that uh, could be plugged in on uh, man in the middle servers and then used to capture traffic on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this was an attack that that demonstrated a transparent proxy, right? They yes. they put themselves in front of something that they didn't control, but by having that certificate for the the intermediate layer, they were able to decrypt that. Um, a question here that I, I consider very interesting is: Does does a CAA record prevent unauthorized certs? And so, so CAA records, uh, which are, which are um, kind of new type of records um, that you can add to your zones. Uh, allows you to specify who can sign certificates for your zone. Now, yeah. if you have an, an A record to take over, that, that, that is still relevant. If you have a sort of DNS man in the middle approach, um, that is relevant. But CAA, in case of an NS record to take over, uh, wouldn't have help because they would have controlled the zone um, and they would be able to either provide their own CAA record or no CAA record at all. Yeah, so, exactly. Mixed exactly. bag there. Yeah, the same, the same applies to DNSSEC. I actually had uh, a few people ask me whether DNSSEC would have helped in this case. Um, and I posited that it might have made a difference. And then John Levine on one of the mailing lists that I'm on reminded me that if you'd had DNSSEC in place and somebody had compromised your uh, registrar account, then presumably they could have used your registrar account to upload a new DS record. And uh, as long as they were themselves familiar with DNSSEC, if they stood up a group of replacement DNS servers for your DNS servers, signed the, the, the bogus zone on those servers, then they could have generated their own DS records and replaced or, yours. So, or, so really, or, or even simpler, they could have just removed the DS record. Right, or remove the DS record. Or, in which case, it wouldn't take place anymore. Um, but, but I think we do touch on a... On a, on a good subject there, which is that I, in, in, in a best case scenario, I think DNSSEC might have given you a bit, a bit better protection because of the overhead. Now, I do see much benefit here if you would also do Dane TLSA, because at that point, you are integrating your, your certificates within your, your DNS level, and, and it becomes much less depending on that CA as on your own trusted DNS zones and, and the signed data you have there. So you might have seen some, some I mean, if, if Dane TLSA was in, in, in usage or in use for a lot of uh, HTTPS validation, uh, it might probably have triggered on some of these, uh, these new certificates that were not from the same parties. Uh, uh, Ingar, there are a couple more questions that I think uh, are, are aimed at you. One of them is from Dan, and he asks, is there an Infoblox audit log function which might indicate compromise? And I think that there is a, a, a log within yeah. iOS that shows you all the changes that have been made, right? I mean, yes, there is an audit log that, that gives you every single change that gets made to the appliance, so you know exactly who makes which change and, and when. Um, I, I believe that from, from an exposure perspective, as, as a vendor, we are less likely to be impacted by these types of attacks where the actual DNS server was taken over. Uh, just because the fact that we're, we're usually, I mean, you, you don't expose your, your Infoblox appliances for configuration to the internet. Um, mm -hmm. you, you have a hardened appliance with, with a lot of security checks in place. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not straightforward or to, to compromise an Infoblox appliance uh, to begin with. Um, so I think that that kind of helps in layering that that security uh, on top of it, which which makes it uh, yeah a better approach to to DNS than than a run of the mill uh, like publicly facing platform. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, who, who I know, hi Tony, uh, asked you, can the script be made of, uh, can the script being made, uh, being created be made available from the services portal? The, the, the cloud services portal, the support services portal. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. We have so many service portals these days. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll follow up with a community post and, and a, a link to the, the GitHub uh, folder where, okay. where we're uh, maintaining it. Um, and we'll probably write a blog about it um, and, and, and do some more marketing around this. But you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be informed about this uh, the moment we push it out. Okay, Tony actually clarified. He said the support services portal. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I mean, I can get it posted there. I, I was, I was looking more at making it available on GitHub so people could, uh, could easily clone and and improve based on their own experiences and and suggest any changes. But yeah, we can we can grab a version and, and put that on the on the support page. Absolutely. Yeah, Rahul asked an interesting question. He says, is it safe to configure a CAA record for a domain? Uh, to authorize a particular certificate authority to issue cer certificates. And he says, what are the disadvantages of using CAA from a security point of view? As far as I know, there are no disadvantages. You could publish a CAA record uh, today, and any CA that's a member of the CA browser forum is supposed to uh, check for the existence of a CAA record before issuing a cert um, for one of your domain names. And uh, if they do find a CAA record and it points to a certificate authority that is not them, then they're not supposed to, they're not supposed, supposed to issue a, uh, a cert. I think that the, the thing that we pointed out earlier is just that if, your, uh, if access to your zone data or your delegation is compromised, the CAA record isn't gonna save you, but mm -hmm. there's no harm in doing it either. Yeah, there was a question here on um, if I associate a network to the domain, I must associate any other domain to one network. Um, no, you, you can have a many to many relationship there. Uh, so, so that is that is definitely not a, a limitation that, that you need to uh, to follow. Um, if, if that's what, if that was the question was. Yeah, yeah. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, asked a question that I think we we um, address, which is why, why do you think DHS didn't identify DNSSEC as a mitigation? And it's because DNSSEC really isn't a mitigation in this case, because if somebody compromises your, uh, your registrar account, then they can change your DS record in addition, or remove your DS record, as you pointed out, Amar, uh, in addition to, to changing your delegation. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, that ain't going to save you. As useful as I happen to think DNSSEC is, um, that would not have done it. Yeah, I have a, an interesting question here also from Larry that says, um, do you have a daily report summary of zone record changes uh, on a per zone basis and daily backups to be leveraged for this? Um, so yes, we, we actually have, uh, you, you could easily build something like that already with our reporting platform. So, so you could build a, a report that gives you um, audit log based summaries and changes per zone or, or for one record type. Um, Leveraging the, uh, the database for this is something that as part of the coming up with the auditing script, it's, it's something that we considered. Uh, but the problem we have there is you don't, you don't know when something was compromised. So how far are you going to look back? Um, and then you, you end up dealing with the database, which is a, which is a pretty complex file. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the reporting approach and, and the checking if, if the IP addresses match where you're going uh, is, is currently the, uh, the, the, the safest bet to, to get yourself. Yeah. Safe. Yeah. Um, somebody, uh, somebody says, uh, Gregoire says, how do you see the results of the DNS integrity check? So I, I think you, you showed how to set up the DNS integrity check. Is there a place that you can go to see the results or do you just wait for an alert to come out? Uh, yeah. So you get syslog alerts and you get SNMP alerts for this. Um, based on, on any monitoring that takes place. Um, yeah, the, the system I have doesn't have the actual Infoblox public zone. It's a, it's a demo system in the lab. So I couldn't demonstrate it. it's triggering to fail. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a syslog events uh, and SNMP trap. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Let's see, we still have questions. And of course, uh, for, for folks who um, have additional questions, Please feel free to add them to uh, the Q&A portion of the UI. Um, 
Uh, Doreen said, I am not clear on how to monitor certificate transparency logs. Uh, is it only if you have DNSSEC enabled as part of the DHS directive to enable DNSSEC? Actually, no, this is unrelated uh, to DNSSEC, but apparently there's a, a part of DHS which monitors the issuance of uh, X509 certificates and they send a report out on a periodic basis. And if, if you're part of the federal government, you can examine that and make sure none of your domain names uh, have had certificates issued that you did not request. Um, John helped us out actually, he had asked a similar question and he found that Google, uh, by searching on Google, you can get a list of the certificates that were issued if you're a non-federal government organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so Roberto asked a follow-up question on the uh, association between IPs and domains. Um, and so, so you, you must not associate everything um, you can just say that this, this one domain has these associations and the rest is, is free for all. So, so you definitely have control about that limitation. Now, if, if you want to override that, that, uh, that association, that is only something that an, an, uh, a super user can do on the system. So they have to first remove the association before they can enter um, a record, an A record that is outside of those ranges. So mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a very high level enforced feature. Uh, Rob asked a question that I think was aimed at you. He said, maybe I missed it, but in which version of NIOS, I believe, was the name server check implemented? Do you, do you know off the top of your head? I went, I went looking through to release notes actually in preparation for this. And I, and I, I still I remember that we even did this in a, in a six, NIOS 6 time frame already. 6.9, I think, comes to mind that, that it was introduced at that level. So it, it's definitely an, an yeah. You should right now. You should be on seven or eight code. Um, so it, it it's definitely in your product at this moment in time. Okay, so really anybody who's kept reasonably up to date on NIOS should have that functionality. Absolutely. And it's free. I mean, it's just part of the product, yep. right? So it's they uh, they may as well use it. Um, here's a question which is actually kind of unrelated to the DHS uh, question, but it's it's um, relevant to tomorrow, which is DNS Flag Day, and uh, our our attendee says, have all your NIOS builds been updated for DNS flag day? Um, and uh, what version should we be on? And the, sh and the short answer is no, um, they haven't. And that's because uh, NIOS uses bind as its DNS protocol engine. And the, even the latest, greatest versions of bind do not have the DNS flag day changes in them yet. Uh, Evan Hunt, who's, I, I would say the lead developer on bind nine, uh, told me that the current DNS flag day um, compliant version of bind is I think 9.13.3. Um, when it comes out in a stable release, it'll be called 9.14. Um, and of course we'll, we'll track that, but it's gonna take a while for 9.14 to come out. And then of course, it'll take some time uh, for us to incorporate uh, 9.14 into NIOS. Yeah. Um Question on the uh, the automation of or the cadence of the uh, audit script. Um, so so yeah. So this is what I was talking with the, the second the second script delivery that we will be doing is uh, so Infobox has a product called NetMRI Network Change and Configuration Management Tool that allows you to do uh, policies. And so in there we're going to launch a uh, script as well that will perform this audit against a list of known IP addresses at regular intervals for you. And so, so you can get your information in there. So together with like CV information, lifecycle information. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Ronald is asking, uh, he said, sorry, I logged in late. How can I use the name server uh, integrity check? Well, you were gonna post details about that, right? Uh, Ingmar? Oh. Come again? Sorry, I was. Uh, Rand, Ronald, Ronald was asking. Um, uh, just uh, uh, he he logged in late and he wanted to, to to find out where he could learn more about the name server integrity check. Of course, you could just look it up in your in your NIOS documentation. Uh, but uh, I believe yeah. I believe you were also going to going to post some information about that, right? Yeah. So we we actually recorded a number of videos that we will be releasing on YouTube uh, that that talk about how these attacks take place, how they leverage uh, existing infrastructure, and and how Infobox could have helped you or, or could have at least mitigated some aspect of these, uh, these types of attacks. Yeah. Um, Matt is asking an, an interesting question about using the Infoblox security ecosystem license to, to notify on security anomalies, notify, for example, his SIEM. 
I don't know if we can do that. Uh, hi, Matt, by the way, I, I know Matt from way back. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't know, can we generate an outbound, uh, an outbound call uh, based on a, a security anomaly? I don't know if we would necessarily detect it as a security anomaly because of yep. course, it just looks like a modification to DNS zone data. We, if somebody's compromised your, your NIOS credentials. No, it, 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 it does not. Um, one way to actually, to actually leverage this would be to do with reporting um, engine, you actually have the ability to, uh, to talk to, to other systems as well. So uh, with a reporting server and an alert from there, uh, you might be able to kickstart it off. Um, again, yeah, it's, it's, it's Daisy, ch Daisy chaining some systems there in a row to, to do that. But uh, it, it's an interesting point uh, that we definitely should take into consideration for the roadmap. Yes, yes, right. Um, one anonymous attendee says, to, so to be clear, TNS was used as a man in the middle to capture and then forward traffic back to the authentic service. The initial foothold was not an issue with the DNS protocol. Uh, likely the six agencies were compromised in a similar way until someone audited the DNS records, right? And, and yes, uh, that is exactly right. So, so someone compromised user accounts that enabled them to gain access to uh, folks registrar accounts to their DNS hosting accounts, then they could modify their DNS data. Because they could modify the DNS data, they could get TLS certs issued. The TLS certs enabled them to pose as the legitimate, uh, the legitimate server while they in fact communicated with the legitimate server on the back end, but could just snoop on all of the traffic as it went through. That, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. A uh, question here was uh, about script for NetMRI. Is it also going to be available for Network Insight? And unfortunately, we, we won't be able to do that because Network Insight doesn't have that scripting engine that we need to leverage for this. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Well, let's see what other questions we have. They're still coming in. It's great. Um, wow. Stephen actually... actually uh, <laughs> actually posted from some code for us, which is, <laughs> which is interesting. I don't think we're going to have the time to go through it and analyze it. Well, let's just, let's just randomly run code that somebody pastes on the internet. We should yeah. always trust that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably, probably not a good, not a good idea. Let's take a, a, a couple more and at, uh, at, at 240 Eastern, we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, let's see. Uh, um, Jeffrey says, uh, the issue I have with zone association is that even as a super user, you can't create records in the zone that would be for third party resources. There should be some sort of ability to override uh, with a super user level. That seems like a good idea. I mean, I guess what he's saying is, for example, if you have a web server uh, that is hosted outside of your network in AWS or with some hosting firm, you should be able to override and uh, add that a record. Yeah, in most cases you would, I mean, I would suggest you use a C name for that. Or, or use like a dedicated zone, sub zone that maybe allow you to do that. So mm, good that, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a good point. That way you you keep like a clear correlation between your IP ranges and any records inside that that zone. So again, but it's 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 up to you. Um, I, I do think that yeah, an, an admin override function is is definitely a, a, a good idea from a, from like a, a sane feature perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, anonymous attendee asks, are anonymous attendees a security risk, which I think is, is excellent. <laughs> um, uh, Anil asks, will the current DNS binaries allow CAA records uh, and resolve via resolver? I, I, I think what he means is that, I mean, I guess we're, it, it depends on which DNS binaries we're talking about. The, certainly the current version of bind will allow you to load up CAA records and, and we support CAA records in NIOS as well. So you can add them via the UI and the API. Yeah, I, I think we added them in, in 7.2 um, uh, or 7.4. Um, and, and yeah, so, but, but our, I mean, from, from a resolver perspective, I think almost every current resolver currently is able to deal with them. Um, and, and any current system from, from an authoritative perspective is also capable to do that. Yeah, any, any modern DNS server should be able to support CAA records. If it doesn't, then you ought to upgrade to a newer, a newer DNS server. All right, well, should we call it a day? I think we'll, uh, we'll cut off our, our um, Q&A there. We did want to mention again that we will have a number of uh, videos coming up that you'll be able to, to take a look at 
um, to see how to use the mechanisms in NIOS in order to address some of these issues. Um, and thank you guys all very, very much for attending. Uh, we appreciate, uh, again, <laughs> your work for the federal government. And uh, we also uh, uh, appreciate your taking time out of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, guys. Bye.